Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Welcome, podcast listeners. It's full-on summertime, and I know none of you are working, which is good, which means you're listening to the podcast on the beach somewhere. Today, we got a great show for you featuring an investment advisor extraordinaire. He's been on all the top advisor lists like Barron's. He's also a notable fintech investor, recognized industry entrepreneur. On top of that, he's co-founded Advice Period, which is on a mission to reinvent wealth management. We're thrilled to have him on the show. Welcome, Steve Lockshin. Thanks, Meb. It's a pleasure to be here. It, see, it's kind of a shame we didn't drag you into the studio. We're local, and I, I've, I've been coming into the office just because it has air conditioning. My house doesn't have air conditioning. It's sweltering here in Los Angeles, but glad to have you on. Are you in LA currently? I'm in LA. I'm hiding in the air conditioning because somehow the uh, humidity that I work so hard to escape from the East Coast has followed me to the West Coast. Yeah. Um, so, but I'm always happy to come to your space. It looks great down there. Well, Je- Jeff and I can relate. We're both from North Carolina, so spent many a summers in Winston-Salem and other places. I love the East Coast, the South, but do not miss that humidity. All right, so we got a lot we're going to banter about today. And I don't particularly love doing this in general, where we just start off and say, tell me your background. But, but yours is actually a pretty interesting storyline because it kind of walks people through the evolution of the wealth management industry and how it's changed in the past 10, 20, 30 years. So I thought it might be interesting to, to have a little, a little highlight reel of kind of the, the Lakshin origin story. Um, and we can kind of go off in many tangents over the course of that but and, and kind of arrive at the advice period story. But why don't, why don't you take us back to the beginning? You make me sound like old man time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny because I think, and we'll talk about this some more, I think it's the Wild West again right now. And when I first got into the business, it was a bit of the Wild West. So I think we're going through another seminal moment. But the history was I started interning from one of the top producers at what was then Leg Mason. He's a top producer at, at then Smith Barney and then now Morgan Stanley and fell in love with the business. But didn't like working at the brokerage firm. So I ended up going into the insurance business, uh, working with a guy who is a very large producer and predominantly focused on corporations and uh, deferred compensation and estate tax stuff. So my love of tax, which will play out through the entire story, really started at the beginning. So this is, you know, straight out of college. In any event, One day, one of my clients said, I know you've got a background in investments, and I'm wondering if you can help me consolidate all my stuff. They'd started a number of public companies, and he had stuff all over the place. And that was the foundation for what became a family office. I I didn't really even know what a family office was at the time, and I started working for this individual. This was 1989. 1994, we said, wow, there are a lot of other people that need this kind of solution where we sit on the same side of the table as the client, let's start offering this service. And I didn't really think about what the right size was, but with the tax focus, I was thinking about larger clients. It was just as easy to hear no from somebody with 2 million as it was with somebody with 200,000 or 20 million is 2 million. So we went after larger clients, focused on estate planning and started our first RIA learning basically without anything to follow. From there, another advisor asked us if we could help them, and we started leasing out our back office, and that became the foundation for Forgent, which was our outsourced solution for reporting and other firms that wanted to offer research. That grew. We ultimately sold that to a financial holding company that also owned a bank in Florida, kept doing what we were doing, grew the business. 2017, we sold it to City National Bank, which is what got me out to Los Angeles, and kept doing the same thing. We wanted to be independent advisors, 
client first, but a few things started happening kind of post-08. And even pre-08, I'd moved towards fewer active and certainly more diversified portfolios, mainly as a business protection mechanism, but also for diversification for clients. So our rule was if it wasn't an index or it wasn't a a fixed income, a conservative fixed income instrument, no more than 10% of a client's assets could be in it. And then kind of post-08, wanted to move more towards passive, liquid, simplified, and focus on what we thought was the big dial, which is taxes and structure. And let's just say the bank, when they bought us, we looked one way and they wanted us to look that way forever. And I wanted to continue to evolve. And uh, we had a very nice separation. And I started advice period. And I guess the end of the, the evolution to bring us today is It was tough to come up with a name where you could find a URL and trademark the name. Um, And I was, after going through hundreds and hundreds, I literally was sitting in my childhood bedroom one night and I'm thinking, I just want to come up with a name that describes what we do. We just want to give advice, period. That's it. And it came to me. And that really is our business. It's a business of advice. And we try to be the the uncola in the advisory business. So hope that wasn't too long of a walk down memory lane, but it's perfect because, you know, it's funny, you, you started out talking and, and we're going to get into kind of wealth management in general here in a second. And but you started out talking about the the old school reps where the topic description was producer. And that already, you know, shows like kind of like one major conflict, which is for a lot of the businesses, these advisors are meant to be producing as much revenue for the company. But often that's a direct conflict with the end client who you're charging. And so you have a comment where your y'all's mission is to reinvent wealth management. So talk to me a little bit about like kind of what's wrong with with wealth management. And w- as you look around the landscape, talk to us a little bit about, you know, advice period and, and how you guys are different. Well, what I think is a challenge in the the industry is the, the co- existing conflicts of interest. And one of them, and you just highlighted it in the, in the term producer, is having purely an AUM base fee. And I, I don't I don't have as much of a problem with it on the asset management side, because that's part and parcel of what you're supposed to do. And if you make the assets grow, you share in the benefit. And if they don't, you share in, in the losses. But when you're on the advisory side, there's some inherent conflicts of interest that show up. And the simple example I always use with someone is, you know, client's got a 5% mortgage and, or it's going to reset to 5% and they've got a pretty conservative portfolio and it's a better solution for them to perhaps pay down that mortgage. Certainly if part of it isn't deductible and get the equivalent of call it a 5% tax-free bond with no volatility by paying that down. If you're on the side of the business, and let's say you work in a major wirehouse where you get compensated for assets under management, well, you're immediately going to hurt yourself because you're taking money out of your assets under management and you're paying down that note. Worse yet, if you happen to have sold the note, because a lot of the financial institutions are now banks and brokerage firms in one, you're taking a double whammy because that's gone and the assets are gone. So there's a a big conflict that exists and most people tend to focus on how they're comped. And if you're comped on AUM, you spend all your time focusing on gathering assets, not on what is going to drive the best result for my client. We can go on in a whole bunch of different areas from the client portfolio looks like the advisor's portfolio, not what fits the client or how advisors make decisions and rationalize that. And so we'll take it wherever you want it. But the, my biggest issue is around conflicts of interest and lack of transparency. So talk to me a little bit about y'all have a slightly different fee structure and tell me kind of a little bit how that works and why you think that's a bit more ideal for uh, investors. And maybe a little bit background about your company as well. Are you servicing really small clients, really big ones, only a handful? Maybe, maybe just a little more color on, on how y'all work. Yeah, with respect to the company, we have no minimum, and we have, think of it as two divisions of the company. We have the lab, which is my group, and it focuses typically on the ultra-affluent clients. Uh, It's very tax-focused, very estate planning-focused, and that doesn't really kick in until you have $30 or more anyway, and it runs up into the billions. But that will also describe part of our fee as we go through that. And then we have a business where we support other advisors that want to use our platform. And many of them have 
clients in the hundreds of thousands into the tens of millions. But for the most part, let's say it averages in the one to five million dollar range uh, for them. And they have different needs. Uh, we try to use technology as much as possible to keep expenses down for the client and charge them a fee that is appropriate for the level of complexity and the level of value that we, we bring. So the fee structure emanates from that where we know that doing asset allocation for somebody with 10 million is no different than someone with 100 million is probably no different than someone with a billion, et cetera. And we know that that is probably true for just about every facet of the services that we provide and arrived at the conclusion that one, we wanted a very clear relationship with the client that we get paid X dollars to do Y services and that fee should vary based on the level of complexity, the level of effort, and the uh, level of value that we bring. And we also didn't want the issue of having to go through, let's say, a 2008 where our revenue's down 20%, but our efforts are doubled because of what's going on that isn't good for managing a business and doing a good job for your clients. And we also felt that every single category of what we provided should have a cap on it for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So it used to be that we could eyeball and say, here's what we think the right fee is, but we ultimately put it into a program and have continued to refine it a bit, but we can sit with a client and answer a series of about five or six questions and it will spit out a fixed fee. And based on that fixed fee, that will become the relationship fee and has a 3% escalator on it to cover wage inflation. And once that relationship is established, we then represent the client 100%. We're indifferent about how much assets we have under management. We're indifferent about whether they're all stocks, all bonds. All we care about is they get the best possible outcome for their situation. So we, we think it better aligns our interests with the client. And of the kind of fee breakdown, do, do you consider, and it seems like from the remarks you've made already, what's the, the biggest value add? Do you think it's the, the biggest time you spend? Is it on the kind of estate tax tax planning side? Or is it uh, kind of vary? So I'll ask you, since you're a student of asset allocation history, if we take not the, the outliers, not the top 5%, um, but if we take, let's say, the top quartile of advisors and we just say, what do you think over a 20-year period through asset allocation or manager selection you can earn in excess return, you know, true alpha uh, on a portfolio? What do you think is a reasonable number per annum. Well, zero. <laughs> with, with right. fees, exactly. Probably negative. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So clearly you are that student. Well, most advisors when, when pressed, uh, particularly those that are selling active, will come in around 50 to 100 basis points. I think, yeah, if, I'm, if I can pick a better manager or we can make some good decisions, I can add 50 to 100 basis points of value. You and I are in the same, of the same mindset that there probably is no real alpha. There's risk premium, et cetera, but maybe no real alpha that's, that's left. That's a lot of money compounded, but the estate tax rate's 40%. And the income tax rate in California, depending on what bracket you're in, is in the 30 to 50 plus percent range. So turning that tax dial is a huge return for clients and be, it doesn't change the, the nature of their portfolio. So there's no increase in risk, no change in liquidity, but there is an immediate or a very tangible outcome that starts in the 20 to 40% range and goes up from there and compounds. And so we think the estate planning and the tax planning lever is, is the most important lever to push on for clients. To back up for a second, this is my normal conversation, which jumps all over the place, but we spend a lot of time thinking about clients and how to keep them from doing really dumb stuff. And so to come up with a lot of behavioral nudges or tricks or systems so that they can kind of stick with it. And one of the things that's interesting to me about your approach is that one of the most brilliant things Wall Street's ever done, and I'll extend to financial advisors and everyone else that, that charges a percent fee is you never really see it. And so we often talk about, you know, the average mutual fund, 1.25%, the average advisor, another percent, that's 2.25% per year that just gets skimmed off and people don't mind because it it's they don't see it. But the the one thing that I'm curious to, to hear if you've had any pushback or 
I'd love to hear how clients have responded is you're actually, so we used to always say for clients, if, if they had to go carry a briefcase full of 20,000 or a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand dollars a year to their advisor instead of it getting kind of feed off they would probably never do it because that would be a lot more painful than than it getting kind of behind the scenes so it's interesting to see you kind of move to this model where you guys are actually you know it's it's actually a number has has there been any sort of reluctance to that or how do you how do you guys approach that whole topic it's kind of like technology in the investment advisory space the stories that are made up are made up by the advisors about the experience they don't want to have. So when I used to hear, because we're paperless and all of our client interactions are either done online or done on an iPad. And in the beginning, advisors, even when my partner said, well, clients don't want that. They want something in front of them, their face. They want to be able to write in the book. We quickly disproved that theory and showed clients the electronic approach and they loved it. And so we went in that direction. It's the same thing with the fees. People think, and we've probably told ourselves and created a, an urban or industry myth that if you go ask somebody to show up with a suitcase with hundreds of thousands of dollars, that they're not going to want to do it. But I'll invert the question on you, and anybody can think about this. When we go to buy things as consumers, we want to know that we're paying a fair price and we're getting a fair outcome. And I used to say around cars, when you would go to buy a car, the arrangement the, that was kind of agreed upon but not said is, I know I'm going to get screwed. I just don't know by how much. And my job is to, is to narrow the gap. And the car salesman's job is to widen the gap. Elon Musk changed that and some of the other car companies by having very transparent, non-negotiable pricing. And that's where the way I think it ultimately should go. Um, and that's what we tried to do. So I can sit in front of a client and say, I'm going to save you at least 10 times the value of my fee the first year. So if you don't think it's worth it, then you shouldn't engage us. And if we're not adding value afterwards, you should fire us. But here's the fee, and I want to make sure I'm making a profit on it without gouging you. The irony is we often tend to be less expensive than the traditional route and deliver a lot more. And that's a mix of both tech and kind of what we focus on and not making the simple unnecessarily complicated, but addressing the complicated and making it simple. You know, I think you and I may may or may not, I think, but I think we do share a little bit of philosophy on kind of automating the asset investment process, which, you know, frees up a lot of time to be doing a lot of other things, a lot of, a lot of headspace, but kind of walk me through You've met with hundreds, probably thousands of potential clients, and I imagine most of them kind of come as a as a hot mess, you know, to to your firm. Maybe maybe some are you know have a button down approach, but we often talk to individuals, institutions, and almost no one seems to really have a plan. <laughs> often when we talk to them, talk to me too, like kind of what what are the biggest considerations? You know, a guy comes in with ten million, fifty million, one million. What what are what are the things you see that are kind of the major drivers where they're the big muscle movements to helping them? Is it is it that they have consistently terrible structured portfolios? Is it that they have no financial worldview estate put together? Kind of what, what's the what's the kind of big picture process? On a, on a lot of the new the newbies. Yeah, it, I mean, it changes based. It's circumstantial, but I can certainly throw them in big categories. The the large clients. So let's just take off the highest value add, but also highest likelihood of opportunity are, are the very very wealthy people because the number of decent estate planning attorneys. And I don't mean people who. There's lots of very very smart, uh, capable, and technically accurate attorneys, but many think in a linear fashion and don't put together or don't MacGyver together a bunch of simple vanilla techniques to have an outstanding outcome. So I don't think there's any reason anybody should have to pay any estate taxes because it's fairly easy to plan around all of them if you have a decent amount of time and some flexibility. So that is the number one thing. And I can say to somebody of wealth, send me your trusts and send me your balance sheet and I'll identify the opportunity straight away. And it's, it's that easy if you know what all the, the moving parts are. So the, the key is 
someone was telling me today, you know, the Henry Ford had an engineer that wanted to charge him a ton for something and he didn't want to pay for it. And after a few more years of losses, he called the engineer back in. The engineer gave him a bill that said, you know, $2 for turning the screw and $2 million for knowing which screw to turn. And that's part of what we do there. And again, it's making that complex part of their planning seem simple. At the at the smaller end, there are things that are important that include just saving more and spending less or restructuring some debt so that it's tax efficient or getting them to make the hard choices. We had some folks in here the other day that um, the hardest decision, and they knew it was the right decision, was to get them to sell their property in New York because it would solve all their problems. It had no debt. It would put more cash in the bank. It would pay off all their other debt. And they just couldn't get there emotionally. And solving that problem for them, showing them the numbers, was what they needed. And again, it was fairly easy for us. So it's not that they're bad portfolios and people are, you know, they, somebody walks in, they're 99% in emerging markets and 1% in MLPs. They're going to be in some mix, probably with higher cost stuff that they need. Those, that becomes fairly straightforward, but there's solutions that are online that'll help them with that. We just kind of make it as digestible as possible. One of the biggest challenges, and maybe you have a solution for this, we'll get to some of your fintech and tech ideas later, but you know, a lot of people that we talk to that are looking for a financial planner, estate, wealth manager, all those things put into one, the problem is, is is such a massive amount of noise and choices. And maybe walk the listeners through who are listening here, and you'll probably get lots of phone calls and emails after this, but walk, walk them through, like, what, what's the best way to go find kick-ass wealth manager? You know, I mean, in, in my mind, it's the same way people try to find a doctor where it's word of mouth, they may go look them up on ZocDoc. Like, how does someone find a, a really killer wealth manager that even start the process if say they're selling their business for 10 million bucks what what how, how do they go about it yeah i mean it's a problem and, and you you uh stole my analogy which is it's it's like finding a doctor and how do most people find doctors which is they ask their friends and they will typically get an answer that is i really like my doctor and unfortunately that is a function of bedside manner as opposed to ability because there's no real way to figure out whether they're doing a good job or not, or they're getting good advice or not. It's only when you have a real medical emergency, you know, it's cancer or it's something that is unique and you need a special surgeon or physician to figure it out that people put in the homework that's required to make a decision around their physician. Unfortunately, dealing with your finances is a lot like your finding your your primary care physician. It's just the house isn't on fire. It's not something that if I don't take care of this today, it's going to have a problem tomorrow. They are where they are in that given moment. And so they go and they ask their friends and they find someone that they like. And when we ask folks about it or we talk to folks, and the story I, I told about in my book, True Story, one of my longest clients, when he came in, he said, we used to do performance analysis for folks when we first started. We'd taken all their information and we'd run performance on it um, for three years looking backwards and tell them where they can improve. And he said, I, I've got two guys. I really like one guy and I really can't stand the other guy. So if you can help me by giving me the evidence so I can fire the guy I don't like and give it to the guy that I do like, that'll really work out for me. Turns out the guy I liked was doing a horrible job and the returns were terrible and he was charging about 2% a year. And the guy he didn't like was doing a great job, just had a lousy personality. So the challenge today is there is no good methodology, even Barron's, which I love and have been the beneficiary of being on their list, still has the challenge of not being able to audit people's returns or find out how many good financial plans did you do last year. As you know, we tried to put something together years ago that would become a good housekeeping seal of approval. And we thought there were certain things that were important in that, like no conflicts of interest and running a real business um, and having certain uh, elements, all of which were auditable and measurable. And that was going to be our mechanism. So today, my advice for folks is kind of like the Warren Buffett advice, where he says, 
people ask me what to do, I tell them put their money in inexpensive Vanguard funds and just forget about it. My advice for the most part is there are a couple of Vanguard life strategy funds that will probably cover 95% of the population. There are robos like Betterment that will cover 95% of the population and ask the right questions. These are all low cost and tax efficient and use those and potentially decouple that from finding a good financial planner. If you can't find a good financial planner, then I would decouple the fee from the product to make sure that there aren't conflicts of interest and hope you're getting some good advice. But people need to know what questions to ask. And I think it's incumbent upon us to try and help them understand what those questions are. And I think there's an opportunity. I, I, I don't have a good solution yet, but one of the challenges in the investment advisor space is can't have testimonials and there. So a lot of the rating sort of sites don't really necessarily work for financial advisors. And on top of that, it's a little hard to do in our world too, because people may just conflate investment returns or short-term stuff with potential like quality. I, I don't know. Like if, if anyone can solve this problem, it's you. So I, I, <laughs> I think trying to come up with some sort of Yelp for financial planners would be an incredible offering, but I, I just don't know of any that would end up coming up having a good business model. I know Brightscope was doing some stuff there, but they've since sold the business and moved on. So I don't know. It's uh, I, I think that should be on your plate, Steve, at some point. <laughs> the challenge with Yelp is it's the blind leading the blind. Yeah, I mean, it's just you've got, there's, there's an attorney here in town, I won't say who it is, that has an unbelievable book of business. And it's all because somehow they got some very large clients. And those large clients told their other friends about it. But this attorney does a horrible job with the clients. And nobody knows better because nobody's asked the question. Uh, and they don't know what question to ask. And so that's that, I think, is the challenge with Yelp. I do think there's a way to, to, to do it, as I mentioned. It's just there has to be enough momentum so that people can get there. There's even, you know, one of my favorite things to tell people about is FIAX. And 99% of the people never heard of FIAX. I don't even know if you're familiar with FIAX. I love FIAX. And you can talk a little bit about it because listeners, you type in, you go to the website, you type in a symbol, and it kicks out highly correlated or similar fund at a much lower fee. But we have we have one of the lowest cost asset allocation ETFs in the industry. So I love it because any almost any asset allocation mutual fund you type in, it kicks out our symbol as a, as the one you should buy. So is it it's feex.com? Yep, exactly. And you you hit the nail on the head. Did I get the description right? Perfectly. And and you actually can hook up with your username and password. It's read only. It'll pull in your whole portfolio and analyze the portfolio and tell you where your opportunity set is and and the only measurable tangible evidence with respect to outperformance or underperformance historically seems to be fees. The fees are too high. The preponderance of underperformance is very, very high. And this helps you understand, just like you said, where are the lower cost solutions? And even how do I find the fund to switch into, or even just tell my advisor, they have a button on there, tell my advisor to switch me into lower cost funds. So it's a good tool and I think probably the first step for folks to um, manage the experience they have is to keep make sure their fees are low and their and their taxes are low. Is there a business model for FX, or is that just kind of done as a service to the the community? There is a business model. I think it's been it's been challenged. You know, I don't, we don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's like anything. Brand matters, and if you haven't heard of it, it's one of my favorite things to ask people in the industry about because most haven't heard of it then you, you know you can be the smartest person in the world, but if nobody n listens to what you have to say, it's not of a lot of value. And they need to be able to get the, the word out in order to, to be around 10 years from now. You know, the, the, the fee thing is interesting because it, I agree with you. Like the number one mistake I see people that come to us, you know, one is they have what our buddy Josh Brown describes as mutual fund salad, where they have like 30 mutual funds and it's just a mess and you can't possibly discern what, what that actual end resulting portfolio looks like. And they're super expensive and tax inefficient. But talk to me a little bit about kind of what, where do you see the world going with this recent news? Fidelity just came out with the first totally zero fee fund, I think first, as you look out on the horizon, kind of what, what, what do you think about the evolution of the fund space? You know, we, we have a lot of transition to ETFs. First time I sat down with you, you were many, many years ago, you were 
extolling the the amazing benefits of automated portfolio management. And this particular was with Betterment. What's the what's the landscape look to you for the, on the investment side going forward? I mentioned early in the discussion that it feels like the wild west again. And so, you know, let's use the 10 to 20 year time frame because, you know, we're probably approaching 30 years from when I first started in this. I think that a few things will be true. The number one thing that I think will be true is that as soon as information becomes both accessible and digestible by consumers. So if you think iPhone and the iPhone was one of the first devices that did not require an instruction manual. It was intuitive. So it was very digestible and people could figure out how to use it. When that becomes the case with information around your portfolio, information around fees, we're going to start to see people behave differently. And that is the only thing that will change the industry because the industry is enjoying a very nice payday for the last five or six decades where I think something like 7% of US GDP is financial services and something like 50 to 60% at its peak, and I think as low as 35%, but still a third to half of US GDP profits comes from financial services. So there's a massive transfer of wealth from the many to the to the few. And that's that's not really what's best for us as investors, it's not what's best for us as a country, I think. But you know, off of that pulpit. I think the other thing that's going to happen is at some point, not only will we continue to see fees and funds come down, possibly because of technology, possibly because of competition, we're also going to see uh, transactional fees effectively go away, which we are today with Robinhood and and some of the other institutions. Um, And they do make money in other ways. As we all know, they make money from security lending and, and flow and things of that nature. But blockchain when it makes its way or whatever the future version of blockchain is, when it makes its way into financial services and moving your portfolio from one institution to another is as easy as moving your telephone number today is from AT&T to Verizon. And for the older listeners, they'll remember that you couldn't do that you know, 20 years ago. It was a nightmare. You had to get a new phone number. Well, when that happens and moving your account uh, is effectively ubiquitous, we're going to see a massive shift in the financial services industry to probably that which favors consumers better because they will start voting with their feet. So it'll be the intersection of those two things, accessible, digestible information, and the ability to move towards that outcome, the better outcome as a result of the information in an efficient and simple way. One of the things I marinate over beer or tea or coffee about a lot is I love this trend and we've written a lot that it's a wonderful time to be an investor. These are very positive trends for investors, the low, the, the fees and costs to be an investor are just dwindling and dwindling. Do you think there's any sort of, what we call it like a, a Netflix blockbuster moment where the, the old style of these 2% mutual funds overnight just kind of goes out of business? Or is this something that's just, it's going to take 20 years, it's going to take 30 years of people dying and getting divorced and passing on assets. Like how, is there going to be any catalyst for this to kind of accelerate this trend? I don't see, I guess, and I guess looking in the rear view mirror when there were opportunities for this event or event like things to happen, whether it was a 2008 or really the explosion of the robos, certainly in the industry. And and even all the wall street firms have robos. Now they just, again, aren't marketing them. I don't see something that would push everyone over unless there was a you know flashing red light that hey here put your data in here and it's going to let you know that you're not you're being taken advantage of and push this button to a better outcome. I just don't see that happening so I think it's going to be an evolution and the other challenge is it's a cottage industry and so there are we're all humans and there are buyers for everything and somebody is going to believe someone's story about something and still be stuck in those expensive or poorly performing or conflicted outcomes, I think that'll persist probably forever. It's just going to continue to be diminished until it's a a smaller part of the equation. And so the interesting part to me is that, so as this evolves and as the technology you, you you've been involved both on your own companies and, and as an investor in many of these technological innovations 
at what point do we get the automated lock shin? And what I mean by that is a lot of the value adds that you know you talk about, at what point can you type in you know this this entire conversation and they say, okay, well, you need to sell your house in New York or hey, you need a grant or trust or hey, these are the steps. Uh, like, is that something you foresee in the coming 10, 15 years building or becoming a part of? Or is there any, is it so far away that it's not even close? What's the look look over the horizon on being able to automate the the ultimate lock shin advisor and software form? I think it's way closer than people think. So two examples. Did you see the um, announcement when Google came out with Duplex? which was the conversation that it would have with a, a person call up a restaurant and make a reservation. You think you're talking to a real human. So that technology exists today and is only going to get refined and we're seeing the beginnings of it. And so there's a couple things that relate to the human factor. One is people believe that empathy is required as part of the equation. And I believe empathy is required as part of the equation and people do business with people they like. If the computer can exude empathy, it's going to do it, and particularly with machine learning, it'll probably do it faster and better than we will, and even have, think of, you know, a thousand years of being a psychologist, that kind of data being eaten up by the computer and effectively reacting in a way that if we didn't have the knowledge, we might not react. Or take it one step farther where it's reading your Apple Watch and noticing your pulse rate or your pulse ox and knowing that it should simultaneously adjust the outcome based on where your stress points are. So all that technology exists today. And then if you look at the advice area, most advisors use financial planning tools because it does the math for them and it simplifies. Or if you look at estate planning where when Robo came out, you know, the, the cry of most advisors is, well, it's, you know, it can't replace humans. It can't do things like estate planning. It's not true. It can do things like estate planning. In fact, it's all rules driven. Everything that's in my head can be put into a computer and it can run through the rules. And if you tell it your answer is A versus B, it turns left and it's B versus A, it turns right. And you get the idea. So I think it is way closer than than people think it is. And obviously the the scalability of that is extreme. That could potentially be the event. I just think the adoption of it will be very, very slow, just like the adoption of electric cars makes complete sense and, and autonomous cars, but it's going to take probably two decades in order to really permeate society. I think the same is true with, with technology and financial advice, but the human really won't need to be a major factor in the future, I think. Good. Sounds like you're working on already. I'm, I'm uh, ready to, to chip into the, to the Series <laughs> A round when you're ready to do it. You know, it's funny, though, because... We only accept Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, we had considered launching a, a HODL ETF, and there's a, there's a particular route that, that I don't understand why any of the ETF issuers aren't using and in in, in HODL for the listeners who aren't familiar with... Co- Crypto is a acronym for in the crypto world for holding on to these cryptos. Anyway, but there's there's a route you could get an ETF out that I don't understand why none, none of these guys have tried to, to do where it could get out in two weeks. Anyway, neither here nor there. How many of your quick quick uh, aside? How many of your investors and client base are asking and interested in crypto? space. I imagine it's died off a little bit since January, but still people pretty... I was just going to say, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> when it was a uh, you know, tulip bulb phase, it was a conversation just came up, and, but it would typically, and hopefully we'd train the clients to think about the right things. It would go something like, I shouldn't be looking at these things, right? But I just, I just want to ask to make sure I'm not missing something. So it wasn't, why aren't we more in these? But as of late, I think there's been enough in the press and on TV and the volatility has been evident enough that that I think at least the kind of clients we deal with see it as as, uh, still kind of speculative and uh, are not pushing uh, to be in in crypto. It would be fun to watch. I'm I'm kind of universally hated by all the Litecoin people because I I sent out a tweet when I was with our Wisdom Tree buddy Jeremy Schwartz in in 
Switzerland that he was planning on launching, joking, obviously, he was planning on launching a Litecoin ETF and the, the whole Litecoin <laughs> e community went crazy over it. And then we got really angry when they found out that that wasn't the case. But but no, going, going back to automation, you know, it's, it's so interesting to me because every time, I mean, look, I, I'm supposed to be an expert in this and the asset allocation world and all that investment stuff. But on the day to day, just even personal finance, I mean, talking to so many friends and people in this world where like so many suboptimal decisions people were making, just very basic, basic stuff. And uh, it I think people would love to be able to kind of just, hey, let's let's ask the computer, should I do X, Y, Z? And, and it seems like something that 10, 20 years from now, we're going to look back and be like, I cannot believe we used to do that just discretionarily on our own. Like what a crazy way to go about it. The same way that for having implemented myself and for clients, I can't fathom why anyone would not use an automated investing solution. In, in my mind, it's, it's such a, why would anyone go back? But that's just me. Um, I think you make sense. I agree with you. Yeah. Preaching to the choir. All right. What else we got here? So talk to me a little bit about uh, what are you getting involved with on the kind of private investing side? I know you've had kind of a, a full tech stack of investing in a lot of early stage companies. Anything got you particularly excited these days? Anything that you guys are building over in the Lockshin Labs? What uh, What's going on in that world? Yep. Answers uh, yes on all of those fronts. My still probably favorite investment right now is, is Quovo. And not just for what they do on the data ag side, but really how they're thinking about what to do with data. I mean, we were already talking about... Explain Quovo for listeners. Quovo is has basically been able to create a set of systems. Some are direct pipes into institutions, uh, but the majority of it replicate the consumer logging in and even deals with multi-factor authentication and then pulls all that data down and provides it in a consolidated manner to folks like us or other financial institutions that, that want to use that data for anything from performance to transactions to accelerating ACATs to validation like when you register at your bank and they know it's you or you want to put a connection between two financial institutions. So that's what, what Quovo is and they were a de novo company just a few years ago and so they've been able to benefit from the latest and greatest technology. The good news is it's been well received and so the amount of data that's flowing through it is is fantastic and is growing at a rapid pace and with that data and the fact they're running new architecture there's a host of things that we can do from predictive analytics to solving things like identifying estate planning opportunities for advisors who don't think about it. And so that continues to be a, a, a very, very important part of, let's say, the investment portfolio of mine. But more importantly, I think the hub of so many different technologies around it that, that we use and will use. But things that uh, we invested in that we're excited about, one is a company, we'll probably roll this out that is the first I've seen of its kind. Uh, the guys came in to visit with me and were basically uh, illustrating that they can do tax loss harvesting and ESG and run a, a parametric period type solution. And there's a number of those out there. And I think they're great. And it's one of the few forms of alpha I think that exists. It's tax alpha for portfolios. And I think it's uh, tax loss harvesting is important. But what I asked them for and no one had been able to do was a pure householding solution. And that householding solution needed to consider not just across entities and family members, but also across taxpayers and estate planning. And so that has been built and we'll roll out the MVP in mid-September and we'll use it ourselves and with my partner, Marty Bicknell, and try it to see if it actually does what we want it to do. But it is hyper fast in converting clients because you put in your username, password, it pulls down everything you've got. We've uploaded the portfolio we want it to be in and it will tell you the most efficient way from a tax and estate planning perspective to reallocate the portfolio. And we'll consider things like charitable, et cetera. So that to me is exciting for two reasons. One, it's going to cut the manpower and work hours on those things down tremendously. You know, for our clients, it can take days sometimes to manually enter information. Now it'll take, you know, enter your username or password. And then no more Excel when it comes to figuring out how to get from where they are to where you want them to be. So 
that to me is one thing that I'm very excited about. And just real quick before uh, we move on to the next one, is it, so the end client on that one will be advisor or there'll be individual offering as well? We, we haven't contemplated an individual offering, but theoretically there should be. The, the problem is the client wouldn't know what portfolio to put it into theoretically if they're not adept at asset allocation. But they might say, I like the Cambria portfolios and I want to convert from where I am to a Cambria portfolio, it would tell you how to do that. So it could have an end user outcome ultimately, but the initial launch will be two advisors to help them better serve their their clients um, and save time. It makes sense. I mean, we talk so much and on, I kind of relentlessly talk about this on Twitter where you know people focus so much, probably 90% of their attention on investment performance of funds and strategies. And then maybe second, I don't know, it would be fees of the actual management fee. But, you know, the taxes is such a major, major component, but it's hard for people because they don't necessarily see it. You know, they see the nominal returns and we are seeing Rob or not presentation where they were just eviscerating mutual funds saying, you know, your many of these that are high fee have like an 80 basis point drag compared to to other funds but the the challenge is is that it's it's the least sexy and most boring but probably like you mentioned biggest alpha generator there is but hard for a lot of people to get their hands around because it's hard to demonstrate that easily to clients and to investors whereas if you just say my fund was up 30 percent last year it's a lot easier than than that anyway and end of rant yeah well that that well, that was and that's one of the challenges. So one of the things I hope we did well was on the output page that an advisor share with the client. It does highlight the the benefits of doing it this way, so they can actually focus not on trying to sell them the the sexiness of a high return, but the benefit of being tax efficient in improving their situation and see what the potential outcome is for that. So that. If it, if it goes the way we hope, hopefully it will be a good tool for us and for advisors and hopefully push the industry forward a little bit. I would use that today. I mean, we, we did a white paper where talking about, you know, people love dividend and high dividend investing, but in taxable accounts, it particularly for high net worth investors, it can be a really suboptimal approach. And so the asset location of a lot of these uh, approaches is is really important as well. So uh, investors think about it. It's a it's an important thing. All right, on to number two. I'm signing you up as an alpha customer now, Please. so you can be a tester for us. And just another thing, you know, we we ended up creating. I believe I can do probably ninety percent of my job if I have one piece of paper, um, or I shouldn't say paper since we're paperless. One screen that has the following things on it. And we built it in Excel and used it for a few years and refined it, and now we're actually putting it uh, out on the web for our clients. But it does two things. One is I just want to see, I know clients want to see, what does my family wealth look like in aggregate? And don't tell it to me by large cap, small cap. I want to know investment assets, personal real estate, commercial real estate, company options, whatever my entire universe of financial is the way that the consumer thinks about it. The next big thing I want to know is how liquid or illiquid I am, because that's something to focus on for folks so that the choice of what they need to do stays on their side of the fence and not the the banks. And then the last thing is for the large clients, what's in my state and what's out of my state and what's the impact. And then behind that are every single entity and the ability to slice and dice. And the outcome of all of this, if you plug the estate plan in right, is a dynamic model that moves all the boxes around. So you can see what uh, someone's estate plan looks like. And if you say, I want to cut Jimmy out of my estate and Meb into my estate, and you make that change, it dynamically updates everything. And so that was something we had to build manually. Of course, anything that you can build in Excel, we can effectively put on the web. And after a few years of using it and refining it, we're putting that out there. I'm excited about that because that to me is the first step in building out the algorithms to start having it automate the estate planning piece and tell people if this, then that, if this, then that behind that. And effectively with a few, with a series of questions, being able to come out with the ideal outcome, which is no different than what we do in our heads, but now the computer will have the model and you can democratize it. And is is that the same sort of thing that's going to be uh, mainly for advisors? Is it going to be, how do you 
see this kind of coming to, to market as well? Probably for us first. And then what we've really talked about doing is releasing it to, let's call it the good guys. So, you know, the, the folks that we think are going to use it properly and not use it as a, as a weapon to sell something that the client might not need. And so we'll roll it out to those advisors and again, see if it starts to propel people in the right direction. But more than anything, it's just a massive time saver for us and allows clients to see things in a very, very simplistic fashion. And, you know, the one thing we haven't spent a lot of time on is I think one of the big issues in the industry is the industry goes out of its way to overcomplicate things for consumers. And that is probably the first line of offense that needs to be fixed is if we can make that complicated stuff simple, it just doesn't serve those who are trying to say, you need to pay me a lot of money because I'm going to explain this to you. And that's what we're trying to do is use these tools to make things simpler. I love the old John Bogle quote where he says he puts half his money in stocks and half his money in bonds. That way he spends half his time worrying he has too much in stocks and half time worrying he has too much in bonds. <laughs> and I think that's I such agree. a just act. And he, he continually does a lot of these updates where he looks back at, I mean, talking basic 60, 40 and very simple allocations and how much better they do than, than so many of these really complicated high fee products. And that the kind of slight segue about, you know, this entire conversation, listeners, um, notice how much of it, you know, despite Steve being an expert on the topic of investments, you know, so much of the end result of being kind of planning focused is is not just about the investment returns. And so does this change the conversation a little bit with your clients? So you've had these over decades at this point, various market cycles, 08 dot com bust, the booming 90s, everything else. You know, one of the biggest challenges in our world as advisors is is keeping investors from harming themselves and the behavioral side of panic and chasing hot investments. Has the has the planning focus changed that to, to have people better comply? Are there any other tricks and ideas and systems that you put into place that you think have helped over the years? Because as a public fund manager, we really don't have any choice because people just continually behave very poorly in public assets where they chase returns. What any any concepts that also may be useful to advisors or individuals when thinking about how how not to do a bunch of dumb stuff with with their portfolios and potentially client client tricks as well? Yeah, I mean, a, a couple come to mind: yeah, proactivity versus reactivity. So we we go out of our way to remind clients. You know, every month we send out a simple email blog that says, here are the returns of the major indices, and here's the return of a bunch of simple portfolios. And three of them are Vanguard Life Strategy Funds, so they're you know one ticker funds, and the other two are just Acqui Ag mixes. So it goes from 40-60 up to 80-20 in stocks versus bonds ratio, just so they've got something to compare against. And then down at the bottom, there are a couple bullet points about why it's important to stay the course and there's some stuff on the uh, SPIVA, you know, active versus passive, just reiterating the, the difficulty that um, active has had in outperforming passive over the last decade or so. So that's part of the proactive piece. If you take one step farther and look at what some of the robos have done is they've actually started monitoring behavior. So back to using Betterment again, they actually went far enough to notice when someone was changing their allocation and then automatically calculating the tax impact and then serving up to the client, hey, are you sure you want to do this? It's going to cost you X, Y, Z dollars in taxes. And the stat that I recall is that cut asset allocation changes down by about 80%. And then the other thing is part of what you're doing, and I mentioned in the Vanguard Life Strategy Funds, if you have everything in one fund, you don't really worry about it if you think about it as a diversified portfolio and you know to ride that you're going to ride the wave. And that has actually been effective for me and for a, a lot of clients. So I have no problem putting clients in a one security portfolio if it's diversified in the way the things that we're talking about are diversified because I'm not out selling that I can pick the best of everything. I don't need to. I'm happy to be the market and be diversified and let capitalism do its thing. You know, th there's a couple of gems in there that you mentioned. One is that 
people, I think, just behave a little differently with a lot of these target date or life cycle funds. And same thing with some of the retirement accounts where the dollar cost averaging in. I, I think a lot of the research has shown in general that that the behavior is better there than in some other areas. But it's funny you mentioned that about the one fund because I can't tell you how many advisors I've I've spoken to that actually say the opposite. And, and maybe it speaks to your business model because so many say, well, Meb, I can't just put my investors into one fund because then what would they be paying me for? <laughs> but once you kind of transition to the model <laughs> where you're you're doing all these other things with the state planning and, and uh, everything else, then that's actually not that challenging of a, of a conversation. That's funny. I've never, I've actually never heard anyone say that. Usually it's the, it's the exact opposite. What else? All right. So we're going to start winding down. I love it. It's Friday afternoon. You and I are the only people apparently working this summer. Jeff, sorry, Jeff is upset. He's in here. He was forced to come in here <laughs> as well. My autoresponder shows that not a single person is working. But a couple more quick questions and we'll let you go, I promise. So let's say someone's convinced after this conversation, they say, okay, I got to get my act together. I clearly am focusing on the wrong things. I want to go chat with an advisor. And let's say they contact you guys, but if not, they go talk to the local uh, advisor. What's like, a, like put them on the right path. What's, what's a couple of the main questions they should be asking uh, just to, to kind of help them along? So if they looked up on Yelp, they looked up on the FPA website, they found a couple advisors to interview. What's a couple just uh, assistance questions that you like hearing or do you think people should ask? And also, you could also include questions to definitely not ask that are, are the wrong, wrong, wrong way to send you down the path too. Yeah, and, and, there, and there's a host of them, and, and some of them lead to others. So, uh, you know, the two things I say: there's a free resource. It was in the book I wrote to help investors try and find a good advisor. Chapter eight was all the questions to ask and the answers, and then we ultimately just turn those into PDFs so they could send out to advisors, and they could keep the answer key for themselves. So it's on the AdvicePeriod.com website. It's also on Lockshin.com. Um, they can well, you can buy the book through. on Amazon. the The name is Get Wise Your Advisor: How to Reach Your Investment Goals Without Getting Ripped Off. Is that right? Exactly. Yep. And I'm happy to send you those. And if you want to use them in any way, that's a free resource for consumers. Um, we'll we'll add them. Questions. We'll add all this stuff to the show links, uh, contact information, websites, all that stuff. So listeners, you can always find that stuff at mebfavor.com forward slash podcast. Okay. Keep going. Perfect. So, so it's, how do you get paid? You know, are you, are do you get commissions or not? What licenses do you hold? If they hold an insurance license, it's probably because they intend to sell insurance. Um, and so those kinds of things will help define what they're going to focus on. Um, one of the questions I, I like to have folks ask, you know, when they're dealing with folks that are notorious, I'll, I'll pick on Goldman for saying one thing and doing another, which, oh yeah, we can be completely open architecture, is ask them, what will the fee be if I tell you you can't use any of your own funds? And so narrowing down the opportunities for the advisors to wiggle out of the facts and embed things. We talked about fees being embedded. Those are the kinds of questions that I encourage people to ask. Understand the team, how often we'd meet, you know, what do they really provide in services and define that? What software do they use? What's my access to information? How much transparency? So all those are the questions. And I think there's enough of them that, which is the reason we created the questions and answers that people won't remember. And they still are going to make decisions based on how they feel when they leave the meeting. You, I would always encourage them, send the questions out before you meet with someone so that it helps define, you know, if someone gives you a referral, send it out to the referral and say, we'll come talk about those when I get in. Um, and it will change the nature of the conversation. Very cool. I love it. If you guys started getting any questions about the new Opportunity Zone tax legislation yet, or is that still kind of too early? Lots. You, are, Lots are, you of optim- questions. are you optimistic no. about it or you think it's interesting? Yeah. What's the what's your thoughts? I think it's interesting. I think it's got a lot of potential. I think it's still early. The regs aren't out. This is another example of where the industry is manufacturing product and demand around something they don't even fully understand yet. And I think it's going to create some real problems for consumers that get going early. So for us, we're still taking a wait and see approach. The tax advisors that we really respect are taking a wait and see approach, but we're trying to understand uh, what will be available. 
I was I was really optimistic that or hopeful I should say not optimistic that that you could potentially get public stocks work public stocks into that but that seems to not, to not be the case which was such a bummer no. I was I was hoping <laughs> we'll see what's been over your career what's been your most memorable investment it could be a stock it could be a good one it could be a bad one it could be baseball cards bubble gum Whatever it is, anything come to mind? Most memorable investment? Uh, I have a couple. So probably my most memorable investment and best story is when I first worked for that family. I was running a tiny bit of the money myself, and I remember I've always been a computer geek, and I went to CompUSA, and on the door it said Intel Inside, and when I went into the back and I was looking at computers, it said Intel Inside, and I opened a magazine, it said Intel Inside, so I went and I bought long dated Intel options and it was right before an inflection point and it was the biggest percentage return I'd ever seen certainly to date and probably for a long time and it was exciting because it was the Peter Lynch you know buy the stuff you love the Toys R Us story which was very cool and then things like I I invested in Betterment and you know right after they launched and it was an unbelievable return and so being on the, the front edge of stuff is, is exciting, and those are the kinds of things. Flextronics was another one. I built my entire house back in Maryland with Flextronics profits, um, and I just went in a little early before they went public, and it just skyrocketed from there. So I've been lucky. It, it's funny because I remember I used to email you every time the Betterment would get marked up. I say, Steve, you see this valuation they're going off at? And he said, yeah, <laughs> I know, Meb, I know. You still behind the cockpit? You still flying? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Still flying a lot. Where uh, where are you going? How often do you do that? Uh, well, I swore when I moved out here I was only going to go between uh, a, a trapezoid of San Diego, uh, San Francisco, you know, kind of Vegas and Scottsdale. But I am now find myself back all over the country. But more than anything, I'm trying to go to Cabo as often as I can. I love Baja, Mexico. I've been many, many times. And have you have you been to the... It's in northern Baja, but the wine country down there. Are you familiar with this? No. So outside of like uh, Rosarito, Ensenada, it's to the east. It's called, uh, I'm going to murder this. It's like Guadalupe Valley. And it's like a Mexican Napa of 50 years ago. And they have world-class restaurants and world-class hotels. It's still dirt roads, but it's one of the coolest places you can go on the planet. And for us, it's a couple hour drive for you, a pretty short plane flight. I don't know where you would land in that area, but some of the absolutely most stunning, um, wineries and, uh, so check it out. But I, uh, I, I've spent a lot of time down in Paha. What a wonderful place. Um, but add, I need, add it to, I need to, to go list. check that out. One more idea for you. I, I just watched this in the past week and as a pilot, you'll appreciate it. They have the, the Google, speeches i forget what it's called we did one once but where people go google talks and the the guy that the catch me if you can have you ever seen that movie with leonardo DiCaprio? oh yeah i've I met him oh awesome uh so that guy gave a speech um i forget what his name is at google have you ever have you ever heard his whole story the real story yeah yeah he spoke at our ypo chapter a couple of times well, He's, there uh, you go frank abingdale yeah, and it's the coolest, and it's nothing. I mean, it's similar, obviously, to the movie. But he gave a speech at Google. It's about an hour long. We'll add it to the show notes. You've probably already heard the whole story, but he is such a wonderful public speaker, and the story is so even more fascinating than the movie. So, um, anyway, uh, <laughs> if you if you got an hour to spare, listeners, check it out. Steve, it's been a blast. Where can people find? I think we mentioned it, but what's the best places to find more info? And people want to reach out to you and and give you all their hard-earned money, where, uh, where where should they go? Adviceperiod.com or steve at adviceperiod.com is the uh, easiest way to reach me, and I'm always happy to hand out referrals if folks need it or help any way I can. Awesome. Steve, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Listeners, you can find the show notes, medfavor.com forward slash podcast. We'll add all these links, Steve's Papers, ideas, suggestions, ways to talk to an advisor, dumb questions not to ask, great questions to ask, all that good stuff. If you're loving the show, if you're hating it, leave us a review on iTunes. Jeff reads every one. I promise we read them all. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Good investing. 